Mike Semper Vivi here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, over-the-air affiliates like KMAV, 99 KMSR, and the Mighty Air 1090. Podcasts, replays on Sirius XM, or maybe your video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully, wherever you are, it's sunny outside. If not, hopefully, it's sunny inside your mind. Beautiful, clear day here on Delmarva. I got a programming note to start. I will not be here on Friday. So don't show up and think that I no-showed, okay? No show Friday. We'll have a replay of one of the shows we did this week. Maybe this one, you never know. But because we're not here on Friday, I will run down what has been announced thus far for the weekend shows. Not all of it, just what's been advertised as both SmackDown and Rampage are already in the can. WWE has made two new signings. I'll let you know about those right now. According to PW Insider today, Brogan Finley, the son of Fit Finley and former NWA Women's Tag Team Champion Matty Renkowski have signed. The 28-year-old Renkowski has also wrestled several matches for AEW. The 21-year-old Finley is the brother of Bullet Club's David Finley and began training in 2020 under AR Fox. He's worked his way around the Indies since then and has now been signed by WWE. There's a lot of WWE talent, former talent, that have gotten their no-competes expiring, and Mustafa Ali is one of those guys, and we'll let you know what he's already got lined up. Matt Riddle has also been announced for an upcoming show, and we'll let you know who that is for. Paramount and Warner Brothers Discovery, yeah, they're in merger talks, and uh, with WBD back in the picture to possibly grab the rights for Raw... We'll take a look at how that might affect AEW. Plus, as we always do on Thursday, the world famous A <laughs> almost said NXT, the world famous AEW Dynamite Report will get started when we get back. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Semper VB here with you. You know we do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day, but if you want us 24-7, you can try to find us on Twitter slash X at Semper VB, at Brian Alvarez, at Filthy Tom Lawler at Jim Valley, I believe at Andrew Zarian as well too, and certainly at Sports Byline USA. You got to make the wrestling news part of your day too, folks. Come on now. I've been telling you this for a long time. Why haven't you done it? Many of you have, and I thank you for it. The rest of you should. Everything you need to know to get your day started, get you up to date, or get you to your favorite wrestling review pod, like Wrestling Observer Radio. Each edition of the wrestling news is between 5 and 15 minutes long, 365 days a year. No clickbait, no speculation or rumors, just the wrestling news. Find it wherever you find your favorite podcasts, or head on over to wrestlingnews.com or at Wrestling News AV on Facebook and Twitter. So, Paramount and Warner Brothers Discovery are in the very early stages of merger talks, which is exactly the way that a professional wrestling show sh should start out. WBD CEO David Zasloff has met with Paramount CEO Bob Backish on Tuesday. Zasloff has also spoken to Paramount's non-executive chairwoman, Sherry Redstone, about the deal. Is a an old major media name, Redstone. Paramount has been sucking wind for a long time now. Apparently they have like $15 billion in debt and things are not looking good for them. WBD has notably done a lot of slashing and burning under the Zaslov regime to reduce the $45 billion in debt or something like that that they had and then start to increase their cash flow, which he says they have done. It wouldn't even be an equal partnership if they got together because WBD is so much bigger and more profitable. But there are assets that are there. Paramount Global has got the Tiffany Network, CBS, which is the one thing that WBD doesn't have, a major American network. They, If they so chose, that they could, in theory, in this case, like merge CBS News with CNN if they wanted to. It also consolidates the shares that both companies would have in another major American network, technically major, the CW. Both companies own 12.5% of that company, with the rest of it owned by Nexstar. Uh, they may then have to end up selling that off in that case, uh, if they were to get together or not. A lot of 
consternation and a lot of things that are making people upset revolve around Paramount Studios and the possibility of that merging with Warner Brothers. And that's even if the federal government were to allow such a thing. But when this whole thing really shakes out, a lot of it comes down to how they can optimize streaming. And if WBD took over Paramount, they would have the 63 million reported subscribers that Paramount Plus has right now roll them into max and then probably kill off paramount plus that's what all of these things are doing they are all now getting together there's a, a bunch of mashing together and people trying to hook each other up and help each other out this, this is why reels ended up on peacock um cnbc uh, said yesterday though you know the sizes of these things could be an issue uh, NBC Universal trying to merge with one of these groups is, is something that federal regulators would hate. And why does any of this matter? It matters because in all of this fluctuation and all of this change, not only does this provide a, a, a way for dopey talking heads like me to fill a bunch of time, but also because it's interesting and it's interesting to see what happens with Monday Night Raw up for grabs. And there's... Apparently, people at WBD who are fans of CM Punk. Not sure which of those people may also have held a grudge against the Briscoes. I'd still like to find that one out. But obviously, people there are fans of CM Punk because the door is back open for WBD negotiating with WWE. Now, could this all be coincidental timing? Yeah. Could two things be true? Yeah. You know, someone there could have an affinity for punk, but, you know, the realistic look of all of these bigger gears grinding away in the background could have caused this door to open back up. We don't exactly know quite yet. WWE Network rights are going to go up in the air, I guess, in, what, late 2025? Or at least they're they're going to be up in 2025, or that's when the negotiations for them will begin. And I think, in theory, that could be a car WWE could tease to WBD if their numbers are truly as robust as Nick Khan said that they were and indicated that they were earlier on this year after Fox had already pulled out and he started going to all those media summits and was shopping all the shows. Is it enough to make it attractive to a new combined Max Paramount gimmick where their main competition is Peacock? I don't know if it matters. It could still hurt Peacock. I would assume it would hurt Peacock a little bit. So, of course, what does that mean then for AEW? <laughs> you know, Disney ESPN is, I don't believe even with ESPN having 87 sub-networks like news and all that sort of stuff, that it's a place that's conducive for pro wrestling at all. The only reason I can see ESPN wanting AEW is that it could probably land over the course of a year, if they, if they expand to 12 pay-per-views, say 100,000 on each one, that's 1 1.2 million pay-per-view buys at 50 bucks. So that's what, $60 million? That could be a reason why they would do it. Uh, you can negotiate for AEW's library to be on ESPN Plus as an addition there. But the thing is, WWE's network will still be up for bid at some point. And what would be more valuable to Disney ESPN, WWE's library of content, which is established, or starting a new one with AEW? Eh. Disney FX is a good spot for AEW to land. It's good for FX. It would be good for AEW. FX is pretty much on every major cable provider out there, every you know, on demands over the top service or whatever you call them with, with YouTube TV and all, all these other types of services, it's there. So you don't lose a whole lot of, of, you know, visual, you know, you don't lose a whole lot that way. Usually FX is around wherever they usually stack TNT and TBS and USA and those sorts of channels. So, you know, that probably is going to be the best move, but then it's still, does Disney, why do they want this? You know, if they lose out on Raw, if they lose out on WWE, would they have an interest in AEW? I think they should under the circumstances. If you look at what FX is doing and the fact that they're lagging back so badly, it would actually be a benefit for them. Fox FS1, we know the network's definitely out. Could there be value there for FS1? Yeah, but the problem is 
where do you put it on the schedule where it airs consistently? And that's just for one show, let alone two. And we'll we'll take Rampage out of that mix. But like the ratings AEW would do, they would love to have. But with everything else that FS1 has on and the money that they pay for college basketball and for college football, you know, I, I think it's a bad spot to be in. I would think that's a bad spot to be in. I think the CW came up earlier on today on Wrestling Observer Radio with Dave Meltzer and Jim Valley. I don't know if going back to them hat in hand after you already turned them down and after they've already picked up NXT is something that would be in the cards, especially, again, with the merger thing going on at that point. But I guess we'll see. They already have the NWA on their app and they have women of wrestling on the station. And that may ne- may not mean a whole lot overall, but it's still content that they don't have to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for, like they would for AEW. And considering they've spent a, bu- a bunch of money to sublease the ACC basketball and football games, and they have N- NASCAR's Xfinity series, and they want to do more of the NFL, that doesn't seem like it's a promising option, which means then you go to the streaming services. And at some point, Google and YouTube are probably going to get involved in this down the line, but it's not now. So then that leaves Apple, Amazon, and Netflix. And Amazon is probably the one that would make the most sense. It's probably the one you could get the most money out of. And it's probably the one that would ultimately, at the end of the day, be the best bet for AEW. But who knows? The mellow music has come in. We can put all that corporate nonsense to the side. We can get into the pro wrestling ring. We get back from break here. On Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. I thank DJ Convoy for pointing out, at least in the Twitch chat, that yes, these mergers are very interesting. Especially for somebody like me who grew up outside of, of DC and remembers Reagan's uh, repeal of the Fairness Doctrine and then remembers when Clinton signed into effect the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which I mean, those two things have led to why you see a lot of the things that you see in media, why you see these media groups that have gotten together because the restrictions on who owns media and and how those media rights are held are just went completely out the window and how news is reported to you and how it is given to you has changed dramatically in that time, but... Uh, What can you do? Ratings news, folks. We're going to go into ratings news. That's my big transition here. Tuesday night's episode of NXT averaged 641,000 viewers on the USA Network, down 5.5% from last week. Third lowest audience the total has done since September 26. NXT drew a .17 rating in the 18-49 to 49 demo, about 223,000 people, down nearly 6% from last week. NXT's lowest rating in that category since August 29th, went head up with the NBA and TNT, which it usually does. TNT did 1.426 million viewers during that time and a .43 in the 18-49 year old demo. We'll see what happens. Maybe the AEW Dynamite number will come out during the show. Last week it did 845,000 viewers with 394,000 of them between 18 and 49 years old. Mustafa Ali is not 49 years old, but my God, he might feel like he's 49 years old. Uh, Once he gets done booking all these indie dates, uh, his non-compete clause, as it has for a lot of wwe releases expired today and several promotions have announced and i mean uh, uh, more than a handful have announced that ali is going to be a part of their show uh prestige wrestling gcw and others have all revealed that ali has been booked for future events it all starts for him apparently on january 19th as he'll face off against gringo loco on a gcw show there will be three promotions in Ontario uh, that Ali works for. Demand Lucha on January 18th, C4 on January 19th, and then he's going to go over to Quebec City on January 20th for NSPW. Then he goes over to the UK and what's being advertised as his UK debut. Was he not over there for WWE? At least this is his UK indie debut. Progress Wrestling uh, announced that he'll be there on January 28th. 
Prestige Wrestling posted that Ali will wrestle Speedball Mike Bailey. So there's the first. I mean, no offense to Gringo Loco, but Ali and Mike Bailey. That's that's kind of that's kind of flashy. That's going to happen on February 25th in Hollywood. The promoters behind Warrior Wrestling in Chicago have announced Ali for Trouble Brewing on March 1st, and Destiny Wrestling is bringing in Ali for its March 3rd show in Mississauga, Ontario. So a lot of people believe that he could be showing up in AEW. He is one person that seems to be on everybody's shortlist as somebody that could be very effective in GCW. We'll see GCW in, in AEW. We'll see if that happens. Matt Riddle is headed back to Major League Wrestling. MLW has confirmed that Riddle will face Jacob Fatu at Kings of Coliseum at the 2300 Arena in Philadelphia on January 6th. Riddle previously wrestled for MLW from December of 2017 to April of 2018. His last match for the promotion was the finals of a tournament to crown a new MLW champion where he was defeated by Shane Strickland. Court Bauer was on the Busted Open show today with Denise Salcedo and Tommy Dreamer. Talk about a Beauty and the Beast scenario there. That's also where he revealed that Sammy Callahan would be starting back with the promotion as both a wrestler and an agent. That Kings of Coliseum show coming up on January 6th. I mean, it's got a incredible lack of Filthy Tom Lawler on it. I mean, that's the first thing that, that really flashes out to me here is where's Filthy? Uh, MLW World Champion Alex Kane will defend against Richard Holiday. World Featherweight Champion Janai Kai with Selena De, De La Renta in her corner will face Hyper Masao. Ricky Shane Page against Akira. There will be blood in that one. Love Doug against Brett Ryan Gosselin. Brent, Brett Ryan Gosselin. Uh, sure. Matt Riddle against Jacob Fatu. So that's what they have advertised on that show. We'll see how the reaction uh, from the public is to MLW signing Matt Riddle and having Matt Riddle on that show. For uh, you know, a good dose of people out there, they are not happy with seeing Matt Riddle around. They don't like Matt Riddle. They don't want to see him booked anywhere. And they say they will not watch wherever Matt Riddle goes. We'll see if that's actually the case or not. Um, it's one of those things that... I don't know. I'm one of those people. Put me in the category, and this is whether he was having issues or not. I don't know what kind of – is he that big of a benefit for AEW? I mean, the fact is he does have, you know, issues at least when it comes to how he is perceived as – taking care of himself and and acting in a you know in his personal life and what he does in his personal life is is certainly one thing i mean you know people have brought up his relationships and and things like that but i mean just the coming back smashed at at jfk airport just that where you're accusing a tsa worker of feeling you up and and being loaded on there i mean with that with you know, the suspensions uh, from the past in WWE, when you look at the whole scenario, it's like there are a lot of people out there who probably don't come with anywhere near as much baggage who don't they don't have the name power, but they're better balls of clay that you might be able to mold and utilize. You know, Mustafa Ali would be, you know, he's not even a ball of clay, you know, somebody younger. I mean, he's an established guy that could walk in and probably help you out a lot. I think Dolph Ziggler could come in and help you out a lot in a certain way. You know, if you don't push him as he's the devil or something like that, or try to push him as a world champion, I think he could probably do a whole lot for you. You know, I'm not sure other than, Again, just just having the name Matt Riddle on your show if you're AEW, I don't know if it's if it's all that important. Now, when it comes to New Japan, when it comes to MLW, when it comes to other places, you know, they're probably going to look more the other way, and they could absolutely use Matt Riddle's name power a whole hell of a lot more. But we'll see how things start to play out with him uh, as we go along here. 
He's, we still have the impact announcement of what Scott DeMora is saying is the biggest signing in impact history or in, in new TNA wrestling history, a big game-changing announcement. So could it be Riddle? We'll see what happens. Since we won't be here tomorrow, as I said a little bit earlier on, let me give you a preview of the weekend's TV shows. As I mentioned, SmackDown's taped, Rampage is taped, Collision will be live. Maybe AEW could announce, like, I don't know, a few more matches for World's End, considering it's only nine days away. There's three so far, but we'll get into that later. WWE SmackDown on Friday. Two U.S. title tournament semifinal matches. Bobby Lashley against Santos Escobar and Kevin Owens against Carmelo Hayes. Holiday Havoc, a eight-woman tag team match. Bianca Belair, Shotzi, Zelina Vega, and Meechan against Damage Control. Universal champion Roman Reigns will also be on that show. AEW Rampage on Friday. Orange Cassidy will be defending his AEW International title against Rocky Romero. We'll let you know during the world-famous Dynamite review, how we ended up with that match. CMLL at Arena Mexico on Friday, I believe. Again, this is going to be one of those uh, $5 price shows. It ends up being like $5.74 or something like that. But those CMLL shows on Friday nights really have been great. Nice change of pace if, if you're looking for one. And Dorade El Idolo teams with Espanto Jr. and Briante Jr. to face Volador Jr., Magnus, and Magia Blanca. Uh, in the post-show press conference after last Friday's show, Andrade indicated that he wanted singles matches with Mystico, Volador, and Atlantis Jr. Uh, it was Atlantis Sr. that took his mask back in 2015, so we may be getting the first step uh, to that Andrade and Volador match on Friday. Man, Volador starts off his his uh, his years just in the toughest way. Last year was with Rocky Romero, giving him all sorts of headaches. And now this, as we go into 2024, it's going to be Andrade. AEW Collision is on Saturday night. Three Continental Classic Blue League matches. Brian Danielson and Claudio Castagnoli, Brody King and Daniel Garcia, Andrade and Eddie Kingston. I still think that Eddie Kingston is going to end that night as one of the men in the semifinals. The acclaimed and Billy Gunn will defend the AEW Trios title against Top Flight and Action Andretti. I'm not saying that they have to do the title change Saturday, but I'm saying do something to keep those two teams paired with each other and in the mix with each other because I think Top Flight and Action Andretti should probably win those titles. I think you've gone as far as you could with the acclaimed and Billy Gunn with them, and the acclaimed, frankly, should be back in the tag team mix. Julia Hart and Sky Blue will face Thunder Rosa and Abaddon, and Keith Lee will face Brian Cage. So that's what they have got going on on that show, and that's what everything is going to be happening for the weekend. Hey, AEW is also, before we go to break, they've announced the double taping of Dynamite and Collision for February. So if you're down in the Huntsville, Alabama area, uh, on Wednesday, February 28th, both shows will be taking place at the Von Braun Center. So AEW has not revealed when tickets for that show will be put on sale, but it is listed on the promotions event page. We'll get back, when we get back, the world famous AEW Dynamite review. Go get you some. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. It is time for the world famous AEW Dynamite review. The holiday bash on TBS last night from the Paycom Center in Oklahoma City. The show opened with the first Continental Classic Gold League match of the night between Swerve Strickland and Roosh a cold open, by the way, to boot there. Uh, there was no light the fuse and breaking the rules and all that sort of stuff. We just went right into Swerve's opening. I enjoyed it much more. Started off with a little bit of mat wrestling and jockeying for advantage. They did a little lucha, a little back and forth. Roosh's hamstring was all taped up and began that selling that early after he hit a dive to the floor and Strickland went to work on it, but Swerve's shoulder was also all taped up, and Roosh took out Swerve's leg as he stood on the apron, and Swerve smashed that shoulder into the mat and then onto the floor. They went to picture-in-picture. Picture. Roosh hit a release belly-to-belly belly, belly belly suplex, I should say, in the corner and went for the bull's horns, but his leg gave out. That allowed Swerve to put on a single-leg Boston Crab and then a stretch muffler, which the crowd popped for. 
Uh, Roosh ended up getting out of that. They ended up on the apron where they were trading chops until Roosh belly to belly swerve onto the floor, which, as Brian would say, looked like it sucked. Uh, Roosh got a two out of that uh, when they got back in the ring, tried to go back up top, but his leg failed him, and that's pretty much where the end came. Swerve knocked him off, hit a 450, but Roosh kicked out with uh, with uh, adrenaline at one. Swerve then followed it up with a flatliner and a brain buster, but Roosh still kicked out. Swerve then kicked him in the head, went up top, and landed the double foot stomp to finally get the win. Swerve now has nine points and put all of the pressure on Jay White for later on, and and Roosh ends up finishing the Continental Classic with six points. After that, we got a subdued, sensitive Chris Jericho to tell us that Kenny Omega's out with diverticulitis. And this went on for two minutes, and Jericho was so aw shucks during it that I kept waiting for Starks and Bill to come in and just start beating the hell out of them. It didn't happen. Also, what didn't happen was an announcement on what's going to be taking place with the AEW, AEW World Tag Team title at World's End. They had six days to figure something out. You got nine left to go. Eh, maybe they're extending out the drama to next week. I don't know, but I'd probably have uh, Starks and Bill run Jericho down leading into whatever surprise you know is actually planned. I thought that would have came off better. And maybe if those belts come off the acclaim this weekend, it's Jericho announcing that it's going to be the acclaimed going after Starks and Bill. And look, with Omega being out for a while, there's no reason to have Jericho in that mix at all with Starks and, and Bill. It, it doesn't help Starks and Bill at all, frankly. And I think they would be much better off maybe going back and forth with the acclaimed. I know the, the promos would be better, as we saw from last Wednesday night. Continental Classic Gold League match, Mark Briscoe against Jay Lethal in a battle of guys who had not won a match during the tournament, but both are awesome, awesome professional wrestlers. This was an awesome professional wrestling match. Easily one of my favorites of the entire tournament. Both guys, 38 years old. Both guys been wrestling for 22 years. Maybe longer in the case of, of Mark Briscoe, having him under the mask at 16 years old. And I think both of them have more to offer than what AEW has given them thus far. We'll see if that changes next year, especially in the case of Mark Briscoe. There were Fargo struts, redneck kung fu, the Cactus Jack nesty plunge. Taz referenced Lynn Swan, who retired in 1982, and everything that happened during the match made sense. It was almost perfect, and what wasn't perfect, you couldn't tell because they're so great at covering things up. Lethal tried a J-Driller, but Mark kicked out at two. He went for it again, but Mark pushed him off. Lethal went for a lethal injection, but Mark reversed it into a burning hammer. He followed it up with his own J-Driller to get the win. They shook hands afterwards. They started the year with a banger of a match between each other in tribute to Jay Briscoe, and they finished with one to watch the match. We then got a short video package on MJF being inducted in the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame that's located on Long Island before we went to break. When we got back from break, we got another video package of an intense Wardlow who says we are closer and closer to MJF's world ending, and it's time to bring the devil to his knees. Samoa Joe then came out to the ring and said that even though Roderick Strong is the dimmest bulb on the Christmas tree, he made a good point last week, every time someone has been laid out by the devil's henchmen, we've seen it, except for MJF, who was just laying there. And, and Joe called him our luscious world champion, <laughs> said he was just laying there with a bottle next to his head. He's got questions, and he wants MJF to come out and answer them, which he does. He's also shooting back with a bunch of insults as well. And then MJF's got accusations of his own. He said when he was laid out in the back as the goons surrounded the ring, they never touched Joe. And MJF wonders why he's waiting until World's End to fight Joe. But before they go any further, they're attacked by a bunch of Max to henchmen. They came out of the crowd. Then a bunch more came out surrounded the ring the lights go out the devil comes on the screen they make a challenge for the roh world tag team title next week max are you a hero mjf begins to ask joe if he teamed with him but then joe grabbed the mic accepted on their behalf before storming to the back 
Better be good. Better be good. Renee's in the back interviewing the best friends, Orange Cassidy, Statlander, Rocky Romero, and Trent. She asks what Rocky and Trent have planned for the rest of the year. Rocky says he's just lost his welterweight title in Mexico, and he's looking for some more international opportunities. Orange then cut him off and said, I get it. I'll see you on Friday, and walks away. And Rocky shocked, and Chris and Trent congratulate him. He's got an international title match on Rampage. AEW Women's World Champion Tony Storm made her way to the commentary booth for the next match between Riho and Soraya for the right to face Storm at World's End. Ruby Soho was shown watching backstage with the announcers noting uh, her relationship, her budding relationship with Angelo Parker, maybe driving a wedge between Soho and Soraya. It wasn't long before the match was in a commercial break where Soraya was back in control. When they came back, Riho began a rally. The crowd was not really that hot for this. Uh, they were also not treated to what was getting, you know, taking place on commentary that we were all getting with Tony and Taz and Excalibur and Tony Schiavone just being ridiculous. Riho used a Northern Light suplex, and I was terrified because I thought Soraya was going to get spiked. She did not. Riho used a double foot stomp and then the running Meteora, and that was that. Tony came down to the ring, broke out some some opera glasses to see Riho with, who ended up jumping her. She hit the 619. Mariah May ran down, hit Rio with the title belt. Tony then took that opportunity to roll out of the ring into Luther's arms and ask who Mariah May was. She acted like she had absolutely no idea who this woman was as she got carried to the back. Tony Schiavone then stood up and read a prepared statement from Christian Cage, which to Tony did a really good job playing this up. It was uh, Cage says he, he took his son Nick Wayne on a well-needed vacation, and he'll be on collision to address Adam Copeland's no-DQ TNT title challenge for World's End. Then we see Samoa Joe and MJF arguing backstage. They go their separate ways. Max just walks a couple of steps, and oh, look what he finds on the ground. It's a black ski mask. The camera pans up, and it's in front of the Mogul Embassy's dressing room. MJF then knocks on the door, pulls Nana out, and demands an explanation. Swerve steps in between them, says, you better keep your hands off my property. They go back and forth. They bring up their past together. They invoke the name of William Regal, insults and all that stuff. Before we finally get to MJF asking if Swerve's the devil, Swerve says he's not the devil, but if MJF keeps getting in his face, he'll bring hell. The Mogul Embassy then steps out of the door. Samoa Joe walks up, pulls Max away, and Nana tells Swerve Strickland as he's closing the door, I'm sorry, boss. I forgot to put you on about collision last week. Could that mean something? I don't know. Wasn't the kingdom originally a, a Prince Nana thing way back when? Am I wrong about that? It's possible. It's possible, especially if you want to keep Brian Cage and uh, Toa Leona and Bishop Khan in ROH. Eh, could Nana have something to do with this? We'll see. Roderick Strong with uh, Taven and Bennett defeated Commander. After the match, Bennett and Taven put Strong's neck brace back on him and began posting MJF is the devil signs all around ringside. Renee got into the ring to ask Strong what they were doing. Strong yelled for Samoa Joe to believe him and to see that MJF is the devil. Renee asked Strong, well, if Joe believed him, wouldn't he have already listened to him by now? To which Strong said, Joe is his best friend by proxy. There are moments with the Roderick Strong thing, and I'm happy after all these years he's on national TV. It doesn't work all the time, and it's too much, and it's... Ugh. I'm not saying it sucks, but it's close. Main event time, John Moxley against Jay White, Continental Classic. This was going to decide everything here for Jay White. White had to win the match outright, to have a chance at, at advancing. Jim Ross came out to join commentary. First time he's been there in a while. Story of the match, Moxley's determination to go all out, even if he already had a spot in the semifinals, and to overcome a knee injury that he picked up in storyline by doing a dive to the outside. They were on the outside quite often during the first part of the match. Moxley hurt his knee, and the show went picture in picture. 
White slammed Moxley's leg around the ring post a few times before turning up his offense. When Moxley did turn things around and he went on the offense, he barely sold the knee at all. He's... He, he, he did. He was He's stomping him in the corner. He's jumping up and down on him, all that sort of stuff. Bret Hart, John Moxley is not, but White did slam Moxley's knee into the ring steps. He then distracted the referee by threatening to use a chair as the ref was getting rid of that chair. He hit Moxley's knee with another chair, went for the Blade Runner, but Moxley reversed it into the paradigm shift for a two count. Moxley then tried for a bulldog choke, but White escaped. Both tried finishers back and forth for a little while. There were half and half suplexes, knee strikes, curb stomps, all that sort of stuff until finally, finally, Jay White reversed a Death Rider and then hit the Blade Runner to get the victory, which means we have a three-way match next Wednesday to decide who gets into the final. As Filthy Tom Waller said a couple of days ago, Makes sense if you're going under the idea that Eddie Kingston could end up in the finals here, that his story with John Moxley can can have one more moment before I would assume Kingston wins, takes advantage of a, a very injured John Moxley, who has now had his knee banged up, and in fact after the match was over, as Swerve Strickland came out to to glare at the two guys in the ring. Jay White went back after Moxley's knee, so we'll see uh, how they play that up coming up on Saturday on Collision, if they do any promos about it, uh, but obviously, at least I think it's pretty obvious, it's going to probably play into the close of the match coming up on Wednesday, so that was your world-famous AEW Dynamite review for Wednesday, December 20th. I know. Just does not have the appeal that, that that Brian can give. It doesn't have that flair. Doesn't have that special feeling that Brian can impart into a report. But don't worry, everybody. Soon he's going to be back. Especially all of you who listen on Wednesdays and love that NXT. Like DJ Conway. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with your Wrestling Observer Live. As I was saying to Dom during the break. If you have to put A1 on a steak, and I like A1, it's not a good steak. It's, just, it's not a good steak. If you put A1 on a steak, it's not a good steak. If you put ketchup on a steak, you probably should be deported. I don't, I don't know where to, but you need to get out. And wherever you are, you, you got to get out. Just don't put ketchup on steak. Don't do it. You probably should go watch the Iron Claw movie. I'm sure the folks over at A24 would appreciate that. Hopefully I'm going to get a chance to see it at some point over the weekend. I doubt I say that, but I'm old and then I won't leave the house. But the thing is, my wife wants to see it really badly. And I can imagine it being what is being described on Wrestling Observer Radio by Dave as I could see it happening. There are people that apparently, if you don't know the story, if you're not all that into wrestling, you watch it, you will love it. If you know the story, which I do, it will drive you nuts. So I look forward to, to that where she loves it and I'm picking it apart. Uh, I'm already see the, the, the Gino Hernandez, not, not, not handsome enough, not, not a handsome enough dude to be Gino Hernandez. Dr. Keith Lipinski pointed that out earlier on Twitter. I agree with him wholeheartedly. That guy doesn't look good. We'll see how it ends up turning out. It's enough for this show, isn't it? Isn't it? I hope your Christmas is great. I don't know if I'm going to be back with you on the 26th or not with Brian. I assume he's going to be back. I don't know if I am or not. So if I'm not, because I don't feel like being here that day, happy Kwanzaa, happy Boxing Day, and all that sort of stuff to you. Definitely for all you out there who celebrate, Merry Christmas. And I hope uh, you get a chance to spend some quality time with your family, the family that you like. Hopefully you don't have to spend too much quality time with the family that you don't like. And hopefully you fill yourself up and gorge yourself on a whole bunch of food and have a hell of a time. I want to thank you out there for listening and watching me this week. I want to thank producer Dom. I want to thank producer Daniel as always. I want to thank producer John on the video. And we shall talk to you again in a few days like after a while. Bye.